Thank you all for coming. My name is Elena Maizel, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Tikva Fund in Israel and the Chairman of the Israeli Forum on Law and Liberty, which is hosting this event in cooperation with the Tel Aviv University Law School. I'm going to say a few words before presenting Professor Danielle Friedman, who will introduce our other esteemed guests and frame the conversation that you're about to hear between Professor Dershowitz and Professor Bell. The Israeli Forum on Law and Liberty is a new national organization in Israel whose mission it is to help deepen and diversify the Israeli legal discourse on law, government, and democracy. Specifically, we aim to provide a platform for the study, discussion, and practice of four principles in Israeli society, individual liberty, limited government, judicial restraint, and a principle uh, quite related to our event today, the separation of powers. We support lectures, debates, conferences, and fellowships relating to the conservative and classical liberal perspectives on these ideas. And we are cultivating a community of people who are also invested in these concepts, be they thinkers or practitioners, students or senior professionals, people drawn from the public or the private sector. We're proud to say that our first student chapter was launched at Hebrew University earlier this year, and that we look forward to working with Tel Aviv University in the coming months. We're thrilled to be able to present this event to you as our first event on the Tel Aviv University campus. I'm uh, glad to see that so many of you came despite the timing, and I appreciate it. We had to make some quick adjustments to the event, uh, and I promise this is true. It's uh, all related to the coronavirus. Um, but the result is that we're going to have a more intimate event, and I hope a really engaged and exciting question and answer session. We've, made, we've left a lot of time for questions and answers, and I hope you use it. I want to acknowledge and thank our guests for lending so generously of their time. Professor Alan Dershowitz of Harvard University. Thank you. And Professor Avi Bell of Bar Ilan and San Diego University. And also, I will say, the Dean of our Summer Seminar on Law and Democracy. Uh, in addition, I want to acknowledge Danny Grossman for his help in putting this event together and to thank <laughs> and to thank Yonatan Green, who is the forum's executive director and the reason that this day actually came together in the end. Uh, finally, it is my honor to introduce Professor Daniel Friedman, one of Israel, Israel's legal luminaries. Professor Friedman is a professor emeritus and the former dean of Tel Aviv uh, Law School. He is a former minister of justice of the state of Israel and received the prestigious Israel Prize for his trailblazing contributions to uh, Israeli law. He is the author of The Purse and the Sword, which is perhaps the definitive work analyzing the Israeli legal system and its overreach. We are privileged as well that he serves as the chairman of the advisory board of the Israeli Forum on Law and Liberty. Professor Friedman. Okay, dear colleagues and uh, students, I'm honored to open the uh, discussion of this, uh, I think, important topic of defending the law principles versus uh, politics. Uh, I'm sure that's going to be a very a highly um, important and also very interesting in view of the um, uh, highly prominent uh, speakers that we uh, have. It's going to be a highly interesting uh, discussion. I will also say a few words on the present situation in Israel, which in many respects is unique. Uh, Israel has no constitution, but despite of absence of a constitution, we managed to have a constitutional crisis, which we do have now. And um, having now, uh, I think, uh, three elections in a row, and nothing is settled yet. So we are waiting and see how it's going to be developed, how everything is going to develop. Now, this crisis is at least in part due to development in the legal fields which uh, were undergoing in Israel, or the Israeli legal revolution, which was going on for, I'd say, about uh, 40 years. Now, uh, the result of this uh, revolution is the involvement or the deep involvement of the legal establishment in the political arena. In fact, the Supreme Court and the Attorney General became uh, players, important players, in the political arena, and uh, to some extent even to dominate it. Um, I would just mention one or two uh, uh, developments. Uh, in fact, all the restrictions that we had in the past, 
that were trying to limit judicial activity in the political area, all these limitations were uh, removed and abolished. Uh, the idea that some matters are not justiciable, all this disappeared. The fact that everybody can apply to the uh, Supreme Court on any matter uh, involving uh, public, uh, public law or public interest. Uh, so the, the, the court is open. In fact, every appointment in the government or in the, um, or in the uh, public field is now open to a challenge, before the, first before the Attorney General and second before the Supreme Court. We also have a very far-reaching decision of the Supreme Court uh, stating that the um, Attorney General uh, opinion is binding upon the government. And this opinion, in theory, is in legal matters. However, since reasonableness became a legal issue, now every governmental decision, every appointment, can be challenged on the ground of reasonableness. So in fact, every decision of the executive and in fact of the legislative branch are now open to challenge or to review before the Attorney General, the Supreme Court, and so on. Now, in addition, we have far-reaching development uh, in, um, in the representation in the court. The, uh, the Supreme Court decided that the government, in fact, as a prime minister of the whole government, has no right to be represented in court unless the Attorney General allows it. I, I, I mean, this is a kind of rule I never heard in any country in the world, and we are very, very much well, you know, Israel is a very unique country. Now, I would say that such an idea that the Prime Minister is not entitled to a day in court unless the Attorney, attorney General agrees is, say, even a front to fair play, a front to, uh, to fair judicial, uh, due judicial process. But that's what we have. Now, in addition, we have um, a very unique and broad interpretation by the court of, um, um, of parliamentary legislation. This means that in some cases, in which the law is abundantly clear, and I would say one, uh, one point on which the uh, law is abundantly clear is the, the uh, possibility that the president will empower um, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is now under um, a number of indictments, he can empower him uh, to form a government. Now, this is very clear from um, uh, parliamentary legislation that this possibility is open. One can argue whether it's a good thing or not such a good thing. Nevertheless, the law is very clear. Nevertheless, as in other situations in which we have a very clear legislation, the question when it comes to the Supreme Court, what's going to be the answer, nobody knows, because that it became an open question. It became an open, an open question because of the technique of interpretation that the court adopted, and very op often the court itself legislates and finds that it's odd that according to its taste, the, uh, its legislation is to be preferred to that of parliament. So it, now we have an open question before the Supreme Court, despite the fact that um, uh, there is very clear uh, um, legislation by Parliament enabling this, I would say, unhappy situation. I agree, but uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the law enables it. In fact, we have here a kind of divergence of opinion or views or approaches between Parliament and, um, and the court. Parliament always adhered to the idea of uh, presumption of innocence. On the other hand, 
the Supreme Court adopted a different approach. They say that so far as public law is concerned, such a uh, presumption does not, does not exist. In fact, the opposite exists. Uh, as, um, an indictment is a presumption of guilt. That's, that's a, the different position of the Supreme Court. Furthermore, we have, um, we have a situation, or a special situation, in the area of criminal law. Uh, the rights of accused have, in many, uh, many respects, been completely, I would say, abolished. The idea against, or the principles against uh, self-incrimination uh, uh, is, for all practical purposes, non-existent. Uh, a number of, uh, of um, criminal offenses that are, um, that are defined very vaguely became the kind of, uh, of, of the, uh, the flag that the court always uses and expands, and uh, thus enabling it to um, impose um, retroactive banishment. In fact, we had a situation whereby for the last 30 years, all prime ministers have been under criminal investigation. Uh, in, uh, and in fact, in our history, in two cases, prime ministers were removed from office. And by the way, as a result, uh, power or governance moved from the left center to the right. In two cases, one was that of Rabin and the other ca case was that of Olmert. The present, uh, in fact, the present crisis uh, we have is also under the shadow of uh, first criminal investigation and now the indictment against uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. I think this is also uh, something that we have to, um, to, to consider, the way uh, the, the rights of a defendant in cases of criminal law and the approach of, the, uh, of parliament uh, as, as opposed to that of uh, the Supreme Court. Now, we are very fortunate to have two prominent uh, speakers that will, be, will speak about the, the subject, the defending the law principle versus uh, politics. Uh, I would say first a few uh, words about uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz. I don't think he needs really an introduction. He, he is very well known, not only here, but in the United States, in fact, the, the world uh, over. Nevertheless, I think it's becoming, just to say, a few words about him. And uh, first, maybe I, I'd remind the history. He uh, became um, a law professor at Harvard Law School, and I believe at the age of uh, 28, he was the youngest pr uh, professor ever to be appointed a uh, law professor in Harvard Law School at this uh, age. And uh, from there, his uh, career went up very rapidly. He became an expert in criminal law and constitutional law. He authored a uh, number of books on diverse topics, including uh, biography, politics, the Bible, and of course, uh, uh, even um, terrorism and uh, whatever, including also not only nonfiction, but also fiction. And I would say there are many of his books have been extremely successful. He also became a legal, legal counsel, uh, not only in criminal law, law but I think uh, his uh, main reputation was in the high uh, profile cases in which he appeared both as a defender or as a legal advisor, uh, and um, achieved, I think, I would say, a phenomenon uh, success. So we have him here, and I think we should all be proud that he's here with us today. Uh, the, the other speaker or the other participant in the discussion is Professor Avi Bell, um, who is a professor in uh, uh, San Diego, and, in, uh, and also in, in Barilan. He is very well known in the fields of property, intellectual property, and uh, international law, having published great many articles that have been enormously successful uh, in this area. He also participated in, uh, uh, I think, 
attacking the infamous uh, Goldstone report, uh, report uh, about the Gaza operation that we had at the time. And I think he contributed uh, very much to uh, putting this um, report in proportion. So I'd uh, welcome both speakers and all of us. It's a real pleasure to be here because, of course, my first encounter with uh, Professor Dershowitz was as a student. Yes. Um, and um, I, I feel that uh, um, I, I'm moving along a little bit. I'm, I'm uh, um, a more experienced, I hope, wiser student now, but still a student. You were a pretty wise student then. <laughs> Thank you. I want to pick up a little bit from where uh, um, uh, Professor Friedman left off. Um, he was uh, talking uh, about uh, the use of uh, criminal processes in, uh, against political and elected figures. Right. Um, you've uh, just come uh, back from having a, um, a, a very interesting experience in, the, uh, in defending um, the U.S. President uh, Donald Trump right. in an impeachment proceeding. I was wondering if you could talk something uh, talk about that. Then I have a follow-up question. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the privilege of being here. Dean Friedman is one of my heroes, one of the great heroes of the Israeli legal system. We've not always agreed about every issue, but I've always enormously respected his points of view. And I found it quite surprising today that I think I agreed with every single word he said. <laughs> now, that will make some of my friends in Israel very unhappy, but as the conversation progresses, whether you've moved toward me or I've moved toward you, I suspect I've moved closer to you as the Israeli legal establishment has moved further and further away from the paradigm. Um, uh, the title of your book, of course, comes from Alexander Hamilton's uh, 65th uh, Federalist paper where he, or uh, actually the 75th one, where he says, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States has neither sword nor purse and has to uh, uh, rely on other branches of government. Uh, so it, it's interesting because when I first came to Israel, I was very critical of the Israeli legal establishment because it had a tradition unlike the United States where people, lawyers on the right, defended right-wing people and right-wing values, lawyers on the left defended left-wing people and left-wing values. And I was very proud of the fact that in the United States, people on the right would defend the left, people on the left would defend the right. Um, one of my first prominent cases was I defended the right of Nazis to march through the streets of Skokie, Illinois, which was a home to many Holocaust survivors. My mom called me on the phone and said, Avi, my name was Avi at the time, um, I only became Alan much, much later, she said, Avi, whose side are you on, the Jews or the Nazis? I said, Mom, on the side of the First Amendment. She said, I'm your mother, don't talk to me that way. You have to pick. You're either on the side of the Nazis or the Jews. I said, Mom, I'm on the side of the Constitution. I never persuaded her. But in America, the American Civil Liberties Union and other organizations always defended the rights of people with whom they disagreed. And in Israel, that was not so much the case. Tragically, it's become the case in the United States. We have now followed your bad example rather than you picking up our good example. So when I defended the rights of the President of the United States not to be impeached on vague charges of abuse of power and obstruction of Congress, the Democrats hated me. I am now a pariah to the left, a pariah to the Democrats. People won't invite us to their homes. My relatives aren't talking to me. Uh, I've lost 10 pounds on what I call the Trump diet. Nobody invites me to dinner. <laughs> Um, and, um, and so we've adopted your bad habits, and, but I still maintain my strong belief that I, was, I am a liberal Democrat, I voted for Hillary Clinton, I voted against Donald Trump. In my speech to the United States Senate, I never once mentioned the name Trump. I was there to defend the Constitution. Uh, I strongly believe that the abuse of power concept is unconstitutional, as I believe, by the way, abuse of trust in Israel, on which Benjamin Netanyahu has been indicted, is uh, uh, in violation of the rule of law. Uh, it's so vague and so open-ended and so general that nobody should ever be prosecuted for abuse of trust. It leaves much too much authority to prosecutors and to judges to define retroactively what abuse of trust means. For me, as a criminal lawyer, for anything to be criminal, you have to have the ham the Hamlet soliloquy, to be or not to be a felon. 
You have to say, I am now crossing the line from innocence to guilt. It has to be a clear line, and you have to willfully and deliberately and with knowledge step over it. And that criteria can never be met with abuse of trust or some of the other crimes that are now being used against political figures. So I was uh, honored to be able to represent the presidency and the Constitution. And um, I made my 70-minute speech. And it was very much based on Talmudic methods of interpretation on part S. I used Pshat and Darash. I used the uh, meanings of the words of the Constitution. The Democrats used Sod and Remez. Uh, they were looking for <laughs> secret interpretations. If you think about the phrases of the Constitution, they are as clear as could be. Treason. It's defined in the Constitution. Bribery. Everybody knows what bribery is, except the Israelis. They're not so sure, but we'll get to that in a minute. But, and then, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Obviously, other high crimes and misdemeanors are crimes akin to treason and bribery. Under any reasonable interpretation of the Constitution, the word misdemeanors is a crime. Blackstone defined misdemeanor as a species of crime. It wasn't always a minor crime. In common law, Blackstone writes about capital misdemeanors for which you can be executed. Pretty serious if you can be executed. Your fortunes weren't forfeited. It wasn't a bill of attainder, but nonetheless very, very serious. And yet the Democrats all opposed my point of view and said that the president could be charged with abuse of power and uh, obstruction of, of Congress. Um, I made the argument. Um, it succeeded. Um, the point of my argument was that it didn't matter what the evidence was. You don't get to the evidence because the crimes alleged were not constitutionally permissible. So I argued against the evidence being used, against witnesses being called. I'm told that I persuaded seven or eight senators of that view. That was enough to prevent witnesses from being called. Uh, and when witnesses were not called, that was really the end. It was clear that the president would not be removed. Had witnesses been called, we don't know what the result would be. It's certainly possible that 10 or 15 or 20 Republicans might have switched had they heard from Bolton, had they heard from others, but it would still have been unconstitutional. And I thought very hard when I made my, my speech in front of the Senate about the Israeli system, and I think there are striking parallels between the indictments against uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and the impeachment of President uh, Trump. Uh, of course, we have different methods of removal in our country and yours. You have a parliamentary democracy subject to some of the arguments that uh, the dean made. We have a system of checks and balances where the legislature is only co-equal to the judicial and executive uh, branches. And um, so um, you can remove a prime minister by a simple vote of 61 to 59, a vote of non-confidence. I guess even 60 to 60. Can you remove on 60 to 60? You need 61 to remove. Okay, but you can't make a prime minister on the basis of 60. So, yeah, we may actually experience that. We, we'll, we'll see what the votes come in later, later today. Um, in, in, in any event, um, because you're a parliamentary democracy, you can remove without any good reason. Uh, the United States rejected the concept of British parliamentary democracy. Uh, the framers explicitly rejected maladministration as a basis for impeachment and implicitly rejected incapacity. So for a hundred and so years, we actually had a system where if you were incapacitated, if you had a heart attack or in a coma, you couldn't be impeached. And so we had to amend the Constitution, the 25th Amendment, to close that gap. People challenged my view by saying, well, what if you had a president who joined a cult? and uh, decided to follow the Rolling Stones and never came into his office, could he be impeached? It was a great challenge, and the answer was no, he could not be impeached. You'd have to amend the Constitution, and you would. Clearly, if that happened, the Constitution would be immediately amended, and we'd include as a criteria failing to show up to work. But that's not a criteria today, and it's not the job of the legislature to fill gaps that the constitutional framers deliberately left. So it was a very interesting debate on the floor of the Senate. Great honor for me to have been there. 
You said I was the youngest professor ever to be appointed at Harvard, also the oldest person ever to argue against impeachment in the United States Senate. <laughs> so it's a nice parenthesis to my career, the youngest and, and the oldest. And um, I do think I helped save the Constitution from politicization and political abuse. If the president had been removed on the grounds of abuse of power, every president of a different party from the House would be impeached. Impeachment would become a normalized, regularized political weapon. 40 of the 45 American presidents have been accused of abusing their power. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, skip a few, Lincoln, Roosevelt, Obama, all have been accused by the political enemies of abuse of power. Abuse of power is not a legal criteria. It's a political cliche. And abuse of trust is not a constitutional criteria for criminalization. It is a weaponized cliche and the Israeli Knesset should abolish that as a criteria for crime. Thank you. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll grab it just because uh, the, I don't seem to have an operating uh, microphone. Um, so I, I, it's one of the interesting uh, contrasts between what you just said and the, the Israeli legal system as, uh, as Professor Friedman described it um, uh, entirely accurately is the, the sense uh, to which uh, criminal defendants' rights attach to public figures. So in, in Israel, there's very much a sense that um, public defendants, um, particularly elected officials, should enjoy fewer rights as defendants because they are representing the, the public, they have to defend the public interest, and lawyers have to act as uh, gatekeepers um, to power and exclude those members of the, of the public service who have not lived up to the very highest standards. I think that uh, recently there was a, a, a candidate for the uh, police commissioner who was rejected on the grounds that uh, a, a candidate for police commissioner should be, uh, the phrase used was, as white as snow. Um, now, you're describing a very different approach, uh, an approach in which uh, not only do the, the public officials enjoy the full rights of criminal defendants, but that uh, there are certain crimes that we shouldn't even consider charging them with. Um, could you explain that, or why do you take this position? First of all, everybody should be equal under the law, but there are certain exemptions. A president, a sitting president, cannot be charged with crime while he is sitting as president under French law. A prime minister cannot be convicted of crime, and Israel is considering, obviously, there's a great debate about whether to adopt uh, the French law. Israel uses its laws too aggressively against prime ministers. You know, today, when you ask for a prime minister's cell number, it's not his phone. Um, I know that, because I got Omer's cell number, and I visited him um, in, in, in prison. And um, I was involved in the Sharon investigation. I was involved in the Omer investigation. I'm obviously very interested in the Netanyahu investigation. Uh, there's far, far too much use of uh, criminal justice, and there's no excuse for it in Israel, because in Israel, you have a parliamentary system. If the Knesset doesn't like a prime minister, just vote him out of office. Uh, the one area I disagree with, I think, Dean Friedman, is he described current events in Israel as a constitutional crisis. I don't think it is. I think it's the democracy working extremely well. Uh, the fact that there were two elections that were inconclusive and perhaps a third one shows democracy is really working because the people of Israel are deeply divided. What's not working well is the American system where Hillary Clinton gets three million more votes than Donald Trump and Donald Trump gets elected president because of some obscure constitutional concept called the Electoral College which in 55 years of teaching constitutional law, I still don't understand. So uh, the, the democracy is working very well in Israel. Nobody ever said democracy should be neat. It's messy. It doesn't produce outcomes and results. It's inefficient. Uh, as Churchill said, it's the worst form of governance except for all the others that have been tried over time. So I congratulate Israel for having deadlocked elections and for representing the people and not having an artificially imposed resolution to an election which should be deadlocked. Now, you can run out of patience, obviously, and I think probably 
one of the reasons that the election results were as they were yesterday is probably some Israelis decided that a vote in one direction rather than another is more likely to break the deadlock, but that's permissible in a democracy. So I'm a fan of Israel's uh, democracy. I am troubled, as the dean is troubled, by the attempt by the judiciary today to have it both ways. Let me explain what I mean. Um, it's very easy for the judiciary to be immune from criticism. Just adopt the British system. Decide nothing of importance. British judges wear wigs, they look nice, but they decide nothing of importance. They decide contract cases, they, yeah, it's important to the litigants, but when's the last time a British high court decided on a major constitutional issue that affected the lives of the average citizen. They don't decide abortion, they don't decide gay rights, they don't decide climate control, they don't decide health care. The United States Supreme Court just granted review yesterday to decide whether the Obama plan for health care is constitutional or unconstitutional. How dare justices who are deciding these issues of everyday importance to all Americans, how dare they suggest they're above criticism? They're not. Once they get into the political arena, they are subject to political criticism. When they decided Bush versus Gore, I wrote a scathing attack on the Supreme Court. I wrote a book called Supreme Injustice, where I challenged the morality of the justices. I challenged their motivation. I accused them all of failing the shoe on the other foot test. I said that if the case had been Gore versus Bush versus, rather than Bush versus Gore, it would have come out the other way. That judges got to vote twice, once on election day and once when they decided who should be the president. And I criticized them, and I was cast Sunstein railed against me. How dare you criticize the motivations of justices? Well, how dare justices intrude on elections? If they do, I'm going to criticize them. And the Israeli Supreme Court today and the Israeli legal establishment is trying to have its cake and eat it in an impossible way. They are trying to increase their activism and then say, well, wait, wait, wait. we're judges. We're not members of the Knesset. We're judges. Don't criticize us. No. When you enter into the political arena as judges, you will be subject to the same kind of criticism as others are subject to when they influence the lives of citizens. That's what a democracy is all about. Well, uh, the, the, the question then uh, presents itself. Uh, um, why do you think it is that uh, uh, your position on the, in the Trump case, in the Netanyahu case, uh, doesn't enjoy more support among uh, your colleagues, my colleagues in academia. It seems that uh, you're out there almost alone. Well, no, let's be very direct about it. Nobody in American academia supported my position on the Trump impeachment. I was literally all alone. 500 law professors signed a petition saying I was wrong. Turns out every single one of them was wrong and I was right. Let me explain why. The best proof of it is I started to write my book, which was entitled The Case Against Impeaching Trump, in the summer of 2016. It had a different title. It was called The Case Against Impeaching Hillary Clinton because Hillary Clinton looked like she would be elected. The Republicans were calling for her impeachment on the day she was sworn in. Remember at the Republican convention, lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. So I decided to write a book against the use of impeachment as a political and partisan weapon, and the title of the book was The Case Against Impeaching Hillary Clinton. Had I written that book, had Hillary Clinton been elected president, they would have built a statue to me at Harvard Law School. I would be the most popular professor. Every one of the 500 who wrote against my argument would have supported my argument. Every single one of them was a hypocrite. They just decided they were on the side against Trump, and therefore they would abuse their academic credentials to sign a petition saying that my constitutional analysis of the impeachment clause was wrong. First of all, none of them did the research. They're contracts professors. They're property professors. They didn't go back like I did and read every single word of every debate at the Constitutional Convention. They didn't read every word of the impeachment provisions of Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton and Richard Nixon. They just voted. As academics, they voted. And their vote is worthless. And therefore, I completely ignore their vote. I have never been one to follow the majority. Um, had I been living in France at the time of the Dreyfus case, 
I wouldn't have followed the majority. Had I been living in Poland at the time of the Mendel Bayless case or Russia, I wouldn't have followed the majority. And I will never follow the majority of academics. Academics don't get to vote. They get to write. Nobody has written a critique of my speech on the floor of the Senate. Nobody has tried to actually criticize substantially and, and substantively what I argued. Instead, Larry Tribe called it bonkers. Um, another professor said I was senile. Uh, name calling galore, but nobody has tried to respond. And that, of course, just energizes me. And um, uh, the same thing is true here. Um, when I wrote my piece in Haaretz, criticizing the charges against uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, the head of the reform movement in America, Rabbi Jaffe, said, I did it for the money. Yeah, Haaretz pays a lot of money for columns. I never got a penny for my views. And it was practically an anti-Semitic trope, saying Jews do it for the money. Uh, the idea that I did it out of principle never occurred to Rabbi Jaffe or many of the academics in Israel who don't like Netanyahu and who voted against Netanyahu and who were therefore prepared to see the criminal or weaponized to achieve their political and partisan results. For me, the Constitution is a matter of principle. I will always apply the same criteria without regard to who the Prime Minister is, without regard to who the President is. I live by my principles. I have been attacked based on my principles. I have a thick skin. The attacks don't bother me. They bother my wife. They bother me when I get emails with pictures of my relatives with targets on them and threats against members of my family. When my wife goes to a spa with friends and a woman sees her and says, oh my God, that's Alan Dershowitz's wife, and leaves the spa, so I can't be in the same spa, as the wife of somebody who has defended President Trump, you know we're living in very divisive times, and that's the most important time for principled constitutional analysts to stick to their principles. Uh, I, you mentioned uh, now several times the Netanyahu case. I, I actually wanted to ask you to, to elaborate a little bit uh, more on your thoughts on it. Uh, in, in particular, um, it's, it's very clear that your, your deepest legal relationship, if I could use that uh, terminology, is with the American system. Um, what is it that leads you, um, besides obviously your being Jewish and this being the Jewish state, what leads you to, to uh, attach yourself to the legal arguments here about Netanyahu, and what do you think is at stake? Well, I care deeply about Israel. I love Israel. This is my hundredth trip to Israel. Um, I have, um, I was so fortunate to come to Israel in 1970 uh, to meet, I was doing a TV program called The Advocates and I was the advocate for Israel. So I got to meet and spend time with Golda Meir, Moshe Dayan, Shimon Perez, who was then a young person having his first basic job in government as the minister, I think, of communication or transportation or something like that. I met all the great Israeli uh, leaders. I have come back repeatedly. I've written extensively. I've written four books about Israel, many, many articles. Uh, one of the first pieces I wrote about Israel was a critique of administrative detention um, based on, and guess who my biggest ally was in my critique of administrative detention? Of all the Israeli leaders, my strongest ally was Menachem Begin. I sat with him, he asked, he, I asked for a meeting, he gave me a 15 minute meeting in the dining room of the Knesset, and four and a half hours later he finally had to say goodbye. And he made the strongest libertarian due process case against administrative detention at a time when the Labor Party was in favor of administrative detention and denial of due process. Um, I wrote a piece in which I struck a balance saying, you know, you may need it in certain extreme cases, but it was being overused. Um, so I've always been concerned about the Israeli uh, legal system. Um, I never disclose who I would vote for in an election. Um, I know Benjamin Netanyahu. I've known all of Israeli's prime ministers in my adult life. I've known uh, Bibi since he was 23 or 24 years old. We met when he was a student at MIT. We were both on the advocates during the 1970s, and we are personal friends. Um, but I was personal friends with Olmert and personal friends with many of Israel's prime ministers. I have to admit I'm a little upset at my friend Ahead Olmert for his recent foray against the peace plan. Um, I helped draft the peace plan in a small way. Uh, I, I went to the White House for two days, worked on it very carefully. 
I think the peace plan is a good basis for negotiations. It will never end up as it is. It's just a format for negotiations. And I fear that the Palestinians will yet again miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity and don't know how to take yes for an answer. And so I would hope it would be a, a basis for going forward. But I care deeply about the Israeli legal system and I think it's deeply, deeply flawed when it comes to um, criminal uh, law. I mentioned already my very strong opposition to abuse of trust, but I feel even more strongly about uh, 4,000 and 2,000, particularly 4,000, in which the quo for a quid pro quo is seeking good media coverage or seeking to avoid negative media coverage. That should never, ever, under any circumstances, you and I share that view, you wrote a brilliant brief on it, you and Nat Lewin, I participated, uh, making that point, Israel is the only democracy in the Western world which has ever used uh, media coverage as a quo, as something of value or something that somebody uh, desires. Um, if the Knesset tomorrow were to be asked to accept a statute, making it a crime for any public figure to seek positive media coverage or avoid negative media coverage, it would not get a single vote in the Knesset because everybody in the Knesset would be guilty. When the Yediot Achronot case came up, I was involved in that as well. I represented Sheldon Adelson and um, I believe that freedom of speech allows him to sell a newspaper on a different business model of giving it out free and making money in advertising. When I took that position, there was a vote in the Knesset, you'll recall, and 40-some-odd uh, members of the Knesset voted in favor of Yediot Achronot and virtually all of them got good coverage and the ones who voted against it got bad coverage. When a person gets elected to the Knesset or any public position in the United States or in Israel, who is the first person they hire? Media consultant. Who's the second person they hire? Pollster, political consultant. Then finally they get to legislative and substantive issues. The most important criteria for a publicly elected official, particularly in the United States where you don't run on party, you run individually, is electability, re-electability. And the idea of making it a crime somehow to exchange anything for positive coverage is so obnoxious to democracy. It's so inconsistent with freedom of the press, so inconsistent with freedom of politics, political figures to vote as they uh, choose to, that um, I think it's a very, very, very serious mistake for uh, Israel to have indicted for my friend, uh, Avichai Mandelblit, who I have great respect for, I've known for many, many years, to have indicted the Prime Minister with that as the quo of quid pro quo, without any precedent, any authority. Oh yeah, there's a, a case somewhere in uh, a small town in Israel, and there's a case somewhere in Brazil, but you can't find real authority for that. And the precedential impact it would have in Israel, and indeed around the world, is so dangerous that I am strongly opposed to it, and I'm strongly opposed to it as a Zionist, as somebody who loves Israel, somebody who believes in Israel. I'm not an Israeli, so my role in opposing it is limited, but as a public intellectual, I'm gonna express my views less strongly than I do in America, but as strongly as I'm permitted to do. Um, when, uh, when Professor Friedman was talking about the constitutional crisis, I think he was less speaking about the, the sequence of election after election and more about um, the slow uh, process he describes in his book about the, the, the seizure of power by the court and uh, um, by the attorney general in a series of cases over decades um, that have uh, taken place at basically at the expense of uh, elected officials. Now, there's a, a, a different side to this debate. Um, the other side of the debate claims that um, um, the constitutional crisis is not in the powers that have been taken by the courts and the attorney general, but the reverse. It is the threat of elected, uh, the elected branches to restore an earlier balance of, uh, of power. Where do you come out of this? It's a great, it's a great question. Uh, look, the United States anticipated this issue back in uh, 1787 and created the most unique system of governance ever seen by any 
democracy. Israel, the United States didn't call itself a democracy, they called itself a republic. They rejected the British parliamentary system. And they created a system of three co-equal branches of government, really two co-equal branches. They never intended the judiciary to be co-equal, as Hamilton wrote, lack of sword and purse. But the executive and the legislature were co-equal. And when they debated, for example, impeachment, um, what Madison, the father of the Constitution, said is he feared most that we'd have a weakened presidency where the president would serve at the pleasure of the legislature, which is what happens in a parliamentary democracy. So we come by this issue legitimately because we have separation of powers and checks and balances. Israel didn't adopt a system of separation of powers and checks and balances. They didn't adopt a constitution. Sorry to tell you folks, too late. You're never gonna have a constitution. It's over. The only time you can ever have a constitution is before politics comes to a country. The United States could not adopt a constitution today. Canada could, because nobody disagrees with anybody in Canada. Everybody gets along. <laughs> Uh, Britain could actually have a written constitution today because the divisions aren't nearly as great, certainly on social issues. Today, conservatives in Britain support a woman's right to choose, support gay marriage, support climate control, support reasonable gun control, support separation of church and state. The divisions aren't as great, but the United States could never get a constitution today. We'd never be able to pass a First Amendment, an Equal Protection Clause, um, and Israel will never be able to get a constitution. You will never be able to get a majority in favor of any resolution of separating religion from state, of the equality of Arab Israelis, on a range of other issues. Too late, sorry. And that's why I understand why my friends Aaron Barak and um, um, other justices decided they had to, in effect, create a system of checks and balances, in effect, create a constitutional system with basic laws, with the ability of the judiciary to serve as a check on populism, that might have been the right approach if Israel had a constitution that it adopted in 1948. You'll all recall the first law of Israel was to adopt a constitution. So, you know, delay, delay, delay. Justice denied is justice denied. Justice delayed is justice denied. So there is no constitution, and one can understand the motivation behind wanting to have a strong activist judiciary, but. It's very hard to find a basis for it in the Israeli political and constitutional structure. As uh, the dean said, you can have a constitutional crisis without having a constitution. Um, I have a friend who has no heart, but he had a heart attack. Um, uh, but so uh, there is a, there is a, uh, a precedent for, for that. Um, in fact, it's only when he had a heart attack that was the first evidence that he ever had a heart. Um, so, um, not a friend, really, but uh, <laughs> in, in any event, I, I really do think that um, we're seeing an Izzat's, uh system develop, and it's not developing organically, it's developing from the top down, and it's an invitation to difficulties. Uh, the Israeli system is in trouble, I agree. If that's what the dean meant by constitutional crisis, I agree with that. Uh, what I meant to suggest is the mere fact that you have multiple elections is not itself a symptom of a constitutional crisis. It really depends. I think maybe the dean thinks that one of the reasons we've had multiple elections is because of debates over the role of the judiciary uh, and the attorney general. Look, ideally there should be three different positions in the Israeli government. There should be a minister of justice, which you have, political figure, advisor to the cabinet, advisor to the prime minister, totally political, he doesn't have to know any law, uh, just a, a minister. Then you should have a director of public prosecution, civil servant, outside the government, appointed with tenure, uh, whose sole job it is to decide who to prosecute. And then you should have somebody who's the advisor to the government, and maybe whose advice is binding or not, that's a debate you can have. But there should be three separate roles. It's much worse in the United States. Because here in Israel, at least you have two separate roles, Minister of Justice and Attorney General. In the United States, it's merged into one job. It's called the Attorney General. The Attorney General is the Minister of Justice. The Attorney General is the political advisor to the President, supposed to help him get elected, supposed to help his agenda get enforced, toast, supposed to be totally loyal to the President. If the President doesn't like the way he looks, Snap your finger, you're fired. The Supreme Court has held you can fire an attorney general without any cause or without any reason the way you can fire any cabinet member. So that's one job. The second job is 
director of public prosecution, the person who decides who to prosecute. There you should have no loyalty to the president, no loyalty to the government, only loyalty to the rule of law. And our attorney general has a schizophrenic job. Um, loyal Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to the president, disloyal and only loyal to the rule of law on Tuesday and Thursday. And then you get legal advisor to the president. There we do have a somewhat separate job. It's not in the Constitution. It's called White House Counsel. Nobody quite knows what the job of White House Counsel is. The White House Counsel was my co-defense co lawyer against the impeachment. He participated in the argument. But in Israel, you have two separate jobs. In the United States, it's all merged in one. And it would be better if there were three. Um, I, I want to open this up to questions from the floor. I just want one last question uh, on a controversial matter before, uh, before we do that. Um, um, shortly after, about a week after the uh, um, uh, Attorney General uh, held his pr press conference announcing that he wanted to indict uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, he held a series of meetings uh, in which he d decided whether to order the Prime Minister to resign ha for having been indicted. Um, the Attorney General ultimately decided that it was premature, that he had the authority to, to do so, but he w wasn't going to do so until after the elections. And it's fairly clear that at some point in the coming weeks, uh, something is going to become before the court, um, more or less asking, um, uh, either asking the, ordering the Prime Minister to step down, or ordering him not to try to form a government. Um, what do you think about that? I think it would be a terrible interference with uh, democracy um, and with the presumption of innocence. A uh, presumption of innocence really means something. Again, you can't have it both ways. An indictment is meaningless. An indictment is a decision to charge. That's all it is. It's really no different than me filing a civil complaint against somebody alleging all kinds of terrible things. Would anybody, if I made a civil complaint against somebody, use that as a basis for making important decisions about whether that person could have a job. When you get an instruction to a jury, or in your system, when the judges decide, the law is very clear. An indictment cannot be considered as evidence. It is simply a charging instrument. And the idea of turning that around and making it into a disqualification and an undoing of an election would do terrible damage to the presumption of innocence, and it would trickle down. Because whatever happens to a public servant will ultimately happen to you and me, to every citizen. And the presumption of innocence will have been irremediably damaged by allowing the courts or the attorney general to disqualify somebody based on an indictment. Now, the problem in Israel is trials take so long that you know, many defendants don't live long enough to be tried. Um, and maybe that can be remedied as well. The idea that you have cases that last two years and three years and uh, have, you know, 900 witnesses and all of that, uh, there has to be a way of expediting and improving that system. But I would be totally opposed to any decision by an attorney general or a court not allowing an indicted person to form a government, not in allowing an indicted person to serve as the prime minister. And I hope Israel does not undercut its presumption of innocence by so ruling. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah I have a question. Uh, I'm not Loud. as uh, articulate as you are. I'm going to try to uh, express myself. I see a problem with what you said. On one hand, you said that the court is a bit too aggressive. On the other hand, you said that uh, you understand the motivation yeah. of the court for being activist in order right. to fill the gap of lack of constitution. Right. So how do we, how do you, we, you, anybody, any legal mind, resolve that tension? First of all, um, I believe in life, tensions don't get resolved. Um, I studied the Talmud, and when I studied the Talmud, my favorite word in the Talmud was teku, um, unresolvable. Uh, in democracy, not everything gets resolved. I understand the motivations, 
behind the movement to empower the court to make these important decisions. But to understand is not necessarily to agree. In the end, I think the court probably has gone too far. Uh, but I understand the motivation. And, and I understand why the absence of a written constitution has been a motivating factor in trying to create an unwritten constitution. But it hasn't happened in England. England has had an unwritten constitution since the Magna Carta, essentially. And that hasn't resulted in judges taking over the role of legislatures or the executive, whatever, however you define the executive in a parliamentary system. So to understand is not necessarily to agree. The tension will continue to exist. Um, Dean Friedman's views will not ultimately prevail in whole. And, um, and, 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 and uh, Aaron Barak's views will not uh, prevail in whole. There will continue to be a tension. I'm reminded of the story of the new rabbi who comes to a shul in New York, comes to the part of the Shema Yisrael, Half the congregation stands up, half the congregation sits down. The half that stands up yells at the half that sits down, stand up! And the half that sits down yells at the congregation that's standing up saying, sit down! The rabbi, who's very upset, and he says to the gabbai, what, what, what's the tradition here? What, what, what's going on? He says, well, you should speak to the old rabbi. The old rabbi who's retired after Shabbos, go to his house, goes to his house, says, Rebbe, Rebbe, half of them stand up and yell at each other. Half of them sit down and yell at each other. It's unacceptable. It's intolerable. Rabbi, what's the tradition? He said, the tradition is half of them stand up, half of them sit down, and they yell at each other. That's the tradition. When I once told that story, my mother interrupted and said, but at least they all say the Shema Yisrael. <laughs> that, too, is part of the tradition. So, you know, there are things we agree with. There are things we disagree with, things that remain in tension, and things that do not remain in tension. Uh you mentioned, uh, you called your defense of the right of the Nazis to march in, in right. Smoky. I'm curious what you think of the current wave of anti-BDS laws, or whether it's fair to attack people who oppose those laws as being anti-Israel. Great question, and the answer is it's yes. It's not my question, so it's the a answer, good question. Well, you should, <laughs> your wife asked the question. The answer is yes and no. Um, I am uh, completely against any law that prohibits advocacy of BDS. Anybody can advocate BDS. Anybody can get up on a platform and say, Israel's a terrible country, Jews are horrible people, you shouldn't buy from Jews, you shouldn't sell to Jews, you shouldn't deal with them. We have the same right to say, you shouldn't buy from blacks, you shouldn't buy from gays. You can say whatever you want. But if you act on that, you are discriminating. And you're not protected by freedom of speech or freedom of advocacy. And to the extent that BDS legislation is directed against discriminatory actions, I support it to the extent that BDS legislation, anti-BDS legislation, is directed against advocacy. I oppose it. Now, a follow-up question from the real asker of the question. Yeah. yeah. That's not actually true because you're discriminating against Israel, but Israel, do Israel doesn't have a right under the Constitution not to be discriminated against, as opposed to an American citizen who's black or gay or whatever. We as Israelis have no rights. You do. Uh, let me tell you why. First of all, the United States has statutes prohibiting discrimination based on national origin. Second of all, BDS applies to me. Um, when I was invited by the Oxford Union to debate uh, BDS, they invited Barghouti to debate against me, the founder of BDS. Barghouti refused, saying Dershowitz is subject to BDS because he's a Jewish Zionist. Um, now, he has the right not to debate me. But he doesn't have the right, if he owned a store, not to sell to me or buy from me. And uh, it would be perfectly permissible for the United States to pass legislation prohibiting anybody from discriminating against Israel or discriminate. L let me be very clear about one thing. I support BDS in the sense that I support a boycott movement and uh, uh, as long as it's done in the right way. A boycott movement should work as follows. It should list every country in the world by two criteria. One, how seriously they violate human rights. Number two, whether or not there's access within the country to the judiciary or to the media to remedy the violation of human rights. By that criteria, Israel would be 227th on a list of 240 countries that you should have BDS against. Number one might be Iran, China, but BDS is not directed based on criteria. 
It's only directed against the nation state of the Jewish people. That's why I wrote a book called The Case Against BDS, Why BDS is Anti-Peace and Anti-Semitic. But you have to distinguish between advocacy and the practice of discrimination. It's an excellent question. Can I ask you just uh, to uh, ask a question? You mentioned a few times how you studied the Talmud and you like right. to base it. I'm not saying that you should follow the Talmud from American law because you follow American law. I just wanted to ask one concept based on the Talmud that has been repeating itself behind what you're saying is that when a judicial system has a flaw in the system, there's a definite murder who, based on the flaw, cannot be held trial, whether there's a flaw in the witnesses, a flaw in the, pro in the process that all the judges held this person is guilty, whatever it is, we have the right for the king to be above the law. When the king is above the law, the king can take care of things in his own hands, however you want to understand the Talmud mm -hmm. in that regard. Okay. How do you understand legal flaws in the U.S. when you get to the wrong result based on the legal system? Is the legal system that holy that you uphold the wrong justice? Or what do you do when there's a flaw in the system, i.e. the O.J. Simpson case which you defended? Right. First of all, every system is deeply flawed. There's no flawless system. Second, I got terrible grades in Talmud. I studied Talmud, but <laughs> my highest grade was Bain or Ni minus. Um, I never even made it to mediocrity. Um, I, I hated the way the rabbis uh, taught me the Talmud, and I began to love the Talmud only when I studied it by myself. Because when I went to yeshiva, if I would ask a question, the typical answer the rabbis gave me was, if the question was such a good one, the rabbis, who were so much smarter than you, would have thought of it much earlier than you, so it's a klutz kasha. And if the rabbis didn't think of it, it's not a good question. So, you know, I, I just not, didn't get along. My rabbi called me in, I went to Yeshiva University High School, called me in at, before graduation and said, Dershowitz, you got a problem here. He said, you know, you got a good mouth on you, but a Yiddish cup you don't have. So you got to figure out something to do with your life where you use your mouth but not your brain. He said, I have two suggestions. One, you could be a conservative rabbi. Or two, you could be a lawyer. I wasn't smart enough to be a conservative rabbi, so I became a lawyer. Uh, what I love about the Talmud is its methodology, not its results. Um, um, I disagree with many of the results of the Talmud, and the Talmud has conflicting views. Dine melkute dina, you, you observe the laws of the country, um, you don't follow the laws if there are flaws, who determines if there's a flaw. Uh, I'm not Socrates, that is, I don't believe so much in the law that I would swallow the hemlock if the law ruled against me. On the other hand, uh, there's a strong presumption if you live in a democracy that you follow the laws. So for me, uh, the Talmud suggests, I mean, when I taught criminal law, first year students for 50 years at Harvard, I would announce in the beginning that you know some of you will be at a disadvantage in the first couple of months. Those of you who didn't go to yeshiva, and those of you who didn't go to a Jesuit school might find it very difficult to understand the Socratic method because the way I taught, I never lectured. There was no such thing as a right answer. Every answer begot another question which begot another question. In fact, when I was asked a question on the floor of the Senate, I said, in my tradition, you answer questions with questions. So I answered a question with a question. So I love the Talmudic approach. I never called it the Socratic approach. I told my students it was the Talmudic approach, but I don't accept the concept of binding halakha in a secular society. I also don't accept the concept of a chief rabbinate. I'm very strongly opposed to the merger of religion and state in Israel and um, the way in which rabbis have the right to determine secular divorces and secular custody and a range of other issues. So I think the Talmud is a wonderful book. If I've said before, if I were ever on a desert island stranded with my students, and I had one FedEx package and I could send for one book, it would probably be the book of Breshit, um, which I wrote a book about, because I think it has every question you want to ask about law, morality, literature, philosophy. On the other hand, I don't feel bound by the answers that rabbis gave over time. I asked in my previous lecture, what the most important halachic decision ever made by a rabbi in the history of Judaism was, and nobody got it right. Um, anybody want to venture against the most single most important halachic decision ever? I wouldn't be here today if not for that decision. You wouldn't be here today. Some of you would be here today. Anybody want to guess? 
Now, it was the rule that said you can go on a boat on Shabbos. If not for the ability to travel on a boat over Shabbos, nobody from Europe would ever have been able to come to the United States of America, and all of our parents and grandparents would have been killed in the Holocaust. Uh, they would have been able to come to Israel because you could get from parts of Europe to Israel in four or five days. But you couldn't get to the United States. So that halachic decision I completely agree with. On some others, we might have a little disagreement. Yeah. Very good question. Uh, one of the phenomena of the Netanyahu investigation is the um, broad application or the recruitment of state witnesses. And so the state witness is a very problematic witness because on the one hand, he has some interest uh, to provide some kind of information maybe to get himself right. uh, out of the problem. On the other hand, the, invest the uh, investigative authorities kind of uh, maybe need to resort to state witnesses in very complex cases right. such as organized crime or high profile or terrorism, cases, terrorism, or terrorism cases, yeah. or, let's say in serious uh, text. Right. So what's your view and how would that be handled? It's a dilemma. States? It's a dilemma. Um, I think that today in Israel and the United States we tolerate too much pressure on state witnesses, uh, and I think many state witnesses have motives to create stories that satisfy the prosecution instead of satisfying ultimate regard for uh, truth. We have a problem in the United States that you don't have as seriously in Israel, it's called the trial penalty. If you're charged with, say, a white collar crime, and you plead guilty, you'll get a one year sentence. If you plead not guilty and are convicted by a jury, you'll get a 10 year sentence. So. You're getting one year for what you did and nine years for having the chutzpah to demand a jury trial. It's less in Israel because you don't have jury trials, but still you have a trial penalty. If you plead guilty, you're going to get, and you cooperate, and you work with the prosecution, you're going to get a lower sentence. That's not the case in Germany uh, today. Germany has abolished the trial penalty. Um, they demand that the same penalty, in theory, in practice, you still get an advantage from pleading guilty because the prosecutor will charge you perhaps with a lower offense. It's a dilemma, insoluble by any legal system. Nobody has ever figured out a way around it. I have been writing against this since 1966. I wrote my first article against punishing people for invoking their Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, punishing people for invoking their Sixth Amendment privilege of going to trial, it's an insoluble dilemma. And as you can tell from my previous expressions, I love insoluble dilemmas because <laughs> they keep me in business. Um, having said that, um, you know, I tried to retire uh, when I turned 75. I wish we had the Israeli system where they make you retire. In America, they don't make you retire. So I tried to voluntarily retire at the age of, of 75. And I realized as a Jew and as a Zionist, you can never retire because the problems never get solved. They always remain. Uh, one year it's right-wing anti-Semitism, another year it's left-wing anti-Zionism, which pretends it's not anti-Semitism, but really is. And so um, dilemmas will continue, they will persist. Anybody who wants to heave a sigh of relief and say, everything's been resolved, I'm satisfied, I can now retire, is not Jewish. You know the best proof that Shakespeare in Merchant of Venice that Shylock actually converted and became a Christian? Because they asked him at the end, are you really converted? And he used the following words from Shakespeare's mouth, I am content, proving he could not possibly be a Jew. Because <laughs> no Jew has ever been content. Thank God for that. I think we have a question from Dan Decker. Okay. Professor Dershowitz, yeah. um, if, are there any limits whatsoever to advocacy, <coughs> even if it gets to uh, a situation of eliminationist advocacy? In other words, would you support the right of Al-Qaeda to march en masse at the 9-11 memorial, or the Ku Klux Klan to march through Harvard University? Um, and if yes or yes. no, it do, okay, it, it seems to collide <laughs> with the IHRA working definition That's of right. anti-Semitism. It does. So can you and, discuss and, that a little bit? Yeah. It, it holds, for example, and I'll, I'll end my question there, it holds, for example, that calling the establishment of the State of Israel a Nazi or a racist endeavor is expressly anti-Semitic right. and outside the bounds of discourse. 
Can you help us? Yeah, sure. Uh, for me, it's very easy because the definition of anti-Semitism doesn't carry criminal punishments. It's just a definition. And it's a definition that allows us to condemn those who use it in the court of public opinion, which I'm perfectly happy to do. But I would not criminalize advocacy. I would criminalize incitement. Now, the difference between advocacy and incitement is not always as clear as it could be. In advocacy, generally, when Jefferson wrote about advocacy, it was mostly in written form. Because when you read something, whether it be Mein Kampf or horrible stuff, you have a filter. You're reading it. You're sitting somewhere. But when somebody stands in front of you, the, there's a famous case in Britain uh, where somebody, there was a policeman holding a gun at somebody's head. And the man who was holding the gun was mentally disturbed. And, and um, somebody shouted, give it to him, give it to him, give it to him. And the issue was whether he meant give it to him, give him the gun, or give it to him, shoot him. And he shot him and killed him. And when you have that kind of direct incitement, when you're standing in front of somebody with a gun, or standing, I had a case early in my career where a professor at Stanford stood in front of the computation center during the Vietnam War and basically said to the crowd, destroy it, destroy it, take it over, destroy it, attack it, attack it. And the question was whether that was advocacy or incitement. And it was a, a close question, and the professor ultimately was fired for incitement rather than advocacy. But I think anything could be advocated, and I think the answer is to respond in the court of public opinion. John Stuart Mill once said that censorship makes us lazy, uh, and it transfers our responsibility to respond in the court of public opinion to government officials who may or may not respond. So I got an honorary degree here about 10 years ago, and it was extraordinarily controversial. Haaretz wrote an editorial against it, and I made Haaretz publish my actual speech to show that their editorial was wrong. What happened is, in my speech accepting the honorary doctorate, I condemned hard left professors at Tel Aviv University who supported BDS and who opposed Zionism and who called for academic boycotts against universities. I condemned them, but defended their rights to say it. So everybody hated me. The right hated me because I didn't want them fired. I defended their right. And the left hated me because I condemned them. But I thought that was the right approach. And the president of the university supported me, even though it got a lot of bad publicity in the media. Haaretz pretended to misunderstand me, but that was a lie. They completely understood my view. They just pretended that they didn't. And so finally, they published online my entire speech, which people could see, took the position that I've always taken throughout my life, that if you're a supporter of freedom of speech, you have a special obligation to participate in the marketplace of ideas and condemn. So when I defended the rights of Nazis to March in Skokie, I condemned them mercilessly on the merits. When I defended the right of a man who was a neo-Nazi um, and was be denied admission to the bar because he was a neo-Nazi, I defended his right to be admitted to the bar, but I attacked him on the merits of his speeches. So I think that when you defend the rights of obnoxious speakers, you take on yourself a special obligation to participate vigorously in the marketplace and attack them. I promise this gentleman over here. <laughs> uh, first, uh, a comment you, you made. Uh, um, um, uh, you mentioned a, a comparison uh, between the uh, popular uh, vote and the existing uh, electoral uh, college. Right. Uh, to my understanding, the uh, United States is a representative uh, uh, republic and to have uh, the popular uh, vote um, uh, rule uh, how decisions are made would give coastal elites, including your ex-friends in Martha's Vineyard, the, the power to uh, uh, decide uh, for all the flyover states. Speaking on uh, the issue of uh, ide ideological uh, monopoly, right. um, if a governmental agency, uh, as in Israel, uh, uh, has in it um, an ideological monopoly and is uh, um, not subject to uh, the, the people, the, 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 the sovereign's uh, oversight, it, this ideological monopoly can be uh, uh, 
uh, used to, um, or the governmental agency can be used to instill this uh, ideological uh, monopoly uh, uh, through the power of this agency. And if how, how do they do that? If you have freedom of speech, how do the elites on the coasts determine what people in the middle of the country... I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually talking about Israel at this, oh, okay. point, at this, okay. at this point. Yeah. Because we don't have that same right you're talking about right. over here, so in the same manner. So, if you have detachment between um, authority mm -hmm. and responsibility, right. and you have an ideological monopoly in a governmental agency, then the ideological, uh, the, ideo the ideology, the idea, the Ideology. The ideology that would be instilled through this government agency would be according to the highest uh, uh, payer. Um, What's the alternative? The, uh, the, 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 uh, the alternative is to create a government monopoly that tells you so, what to think. So, right. uh, this is, this is where, where right. we're at. This is, this is my, my, my question. My question is, when you eliminate mm -hmm. the requirement of having a legal standing mm -hmm. in court, yeah. Uh, then you open up uh, the uh, uh, the door for external uh, uh, agents uh, to, as Posner uh, uh, mentioned, have uh, uh, petitioned the court on theoretical uh, issues and not things that have already Look, that's a fire. fair point. That's a fair point. So I'm I'm, yeah. I'm asking. Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, uh, giving the the court the ability? to eliminate the requirement for legal standing, uh, standing uh, and uh, invite foreign NGOs, yeah, yeah. agents, does that uh, 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 hinder or weaken Israel's democracy? Uh, okay, it's a very good question. You asked really two questions. One about the Electoral College. I don't agree with you on that because the question is what is the unit of democracy? Is it the person or the state? Uh, when the United States was first established, the unit of democracy was the state. Uh, we had a federalist system and states had rights. So that explains the Electoral College. But I think today uh, we've moved very far away from that. On the issue of standing, I, I have some sympathy with you. I think the courts have gone too far in eliminating standing. I think American courts haven't gone far enough in eliminating standing. I think in American courts, we're too uh, difficult to be, a, be able to get into the courts. And in Israel, it's far too easy. I would like to see a balance struck. I, I am completely opposed to NGOs, foreign NGOs, uh, having standing in Israel's uh, uh, courts, um, not only on, cons both on conceptual grounds and also we know where the NGOs stand for. They don't care about Israel. Um, and um, let me make another point. They don't care about the Palestinians. Let me make a point here, which I've made before. There are only two groups today in the world that care about the Palestinians the Palestinians and the Israelis, and not in that order. The Israelis, I think, care more about the Palestinians' day-to-day -day life than most Palestinian leaders. But let me tell you who doesn't care about the Palestinians. NGOs, the Human Rights Council, academics on the hard left, they only care about Israel. They do not care about the Palestinians. The Palestinians are simply a method, a route into their anti-Israel extremism. What's my proof of it? Very simple, the Kurds. If you cared about human rights, you would care more about the Kurds than the Palestinians. The Kurds have a far greater right to statehood, legally, morally, linguistically, ethnically, religiously. There are more of them. They have never turned down statehood the way the Palestinians had in 38, 48, 67, 2000, 2001, 2008. Uh, the only reason the Palestinians get sympathy is because they're alleged the pressures are the nation state of the Jewish people. If the Kurds were lucky enough to be oppressed by Jews, they would be today the leading group of human rights sufferers in the world. Or if the Palestinians were unlucky enough to be allegedly oppressed by the Turks, the Syrians, the Iraqis, and the Iranians, nobody would care about the Palestinians. Nobody gives a damn about the Palestinians, except Israelis and the Palestinians. The Gulf states don't. They only care about, but they care about Jerusalem, but they don't care about the Palestinian people. They're fed up with them. They're sick and tired of them. I hear it all the time from people I know in the Gulf states. And therefore, the Palestinians better get on the case and better sit down and negotiate, because this may be one of their last chances. One thing I support clearly about the plan, and what I opposed with Olmert's offer in 2008, is you never, ever give a group 
a better plan after they've rejected the first one. When they reject the first one, the second one must be worse. And the third one, worse than that. And the fourth one, worse than that. And so if the Palestinians reject this plan, the next plan should be less generous than this one. Olmert made a tactical, serious mistake by giving them a better plan. Of course, they didn't accept it, and now they expect a better plan. They're not going to get a better plan having rejected the first plan. So I'm strongly in favor of a two-state solution, protecting Israel's security. I'm in favor of it not because I love the Palestinians. Um, I care about the Palestinians as human beings, but I care about the Kurds just as much. I think the two-state solution with Israel's security is essential for Israel to thrive as a d democratic nation state of the Jewish people. On that point, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Professor Dershowitz, just to come back a bit to the, um, the issue of the separation of powers, sure. you were very articulate in arguing why our criminal system here in Israel doesn't afford really a basis for charging the Prime Minister with uh, uh, breach of trust, as, right. as you said. So that related mostly to, to one of the cases, case 1000, a bit also to case uh, 2000. That's right. Uh, the other case, in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, the, the Wallet case, which is also medium right. 4,000, yeah. Right, 4,000 case in terms of uh, Bezik and the regulatory issues. Yeah. But also the, the case uh, uh, 1000 about bribery. Can you address those a little bit sure. more in detail from your perspective? Okay, sure. Because it's only First two of all, two I support uh, allegations against bribery of the kind that are in the 1,000, but I think for it to be legitimate, the Knesset has to pass a specific statute saying that any prime minister, any public official who accepts more than 10,000 shekels worth of benefits is guilty. So if you accept 9,999, you're totally innocent, and if you accept 1, 10,001, you're totally guilty. I believe in lines, I believe in red lines, I believe you have to know what the law is, and you have to know that you're violating it. The idea that, well, too much is too much, we'll decide whether or not he had too much champagne, too many cigars, that's unacceptable in a democracy. So I'm totally opposed to 1,000. 4,000 is very different. I'm opposed to that for the reasons I gave about the quo being seeking media or demanding even media uh, uh, coverage. So I have different reasons for opposing. 2,000, of course, is a little bit more complicated because it has media interest, but it's also an abuse of trust. So that suffers from both. Hey, yeah. Um, well, there have been a number of things that I disagreed with, but I figured I'd pick the most sure. recent one, um, <coughs> which is, first of all, what you said um, about how nobody cares about Palestinians. That's right. um, so I happen to spend a lot of time around liberals, and I think um, liberals care about Muslims being abused in China. They care about. They do. Have you ever heard of a demonstration about? Absolutely. I've never Absolutely. heard of it. In the university where I studied in last yeah. year, yeah. a Chinese government, uh, a, a, somebody pro-Chinese, donated millions of dollars to establish yeah. a pro-Chinese uh, program in the school, and there was a protest to it. How many people I, attended the protest? Literally the entire political science faculty twelve walked out 15, of the school. Yeah. Literally all of the yeah. the entire political science faculty said we will quit the school. No, no, no. We, we live in a different universe. universe. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we definitely live yeah. in a different yeah. universe. And how about how about the Kurds? Kurds? Have you ever heard of a protest about the Kurds? On any university campus ever? So your logic is that unless we symmetrically right. uh, protest Absolutely. every single person, we're discriminating. No, no. You, unless you protest in order of the seriousness of the violation of human rights, you're a hypocrite. That's my position. Yeah. So the Kurds okay, come so, first, the Palestinians so, come so second. Now, so, so now that we've right. cleared that line, yeah. now I, I'd like to talk to you as somebody who opposes right. human rights violations everywhere, I do. but particularly please, here. Please try to make sure. this more okay. of a question. Okay. Okay. Oh, sure. it's, it's coming. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that one reason why Americans have a specific reason to protest the way that Palestinians are treated as opposed to anything else is because we've funded so much of it. Nonsense. That's not nonsense. Would, if you abolish the funding tomorrow, and by the way, there's a good case for abolishing the funding to Israel. Israel's a rich but first world nation. That, but but if you me. abolish the funding tomorrow, it wouldn't change one thing on a university campus. That's an excuse. The funding is an excuse 
The reason is it's Israel. That's the only reason. That's why Jews are so strongly opposed to Israel, because it's Israel. It's the nation state of the Jewish people. That's why anti-Semites are so opposed, because it's Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people. And you can try to persuade me of the opposite, and I'm so thrilled to hear that there was a protest at one university about the Chinese putting tens of thousands of Muslims in concentration camps. But I have to tell you, I follow, I've spoken to 200 American universities. I have never heard of a protest against any human rights violation in any of those universities except for Israel, period. Yeah, we yeah. have we have limited okay. time here. Yeah. I promise yeah. this gentleman, okay. and then you, yeah. and then you, and that's we're going to close there. Sure. So please go ahead. You 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 said you understand the approach of uh, Aaron Parag and yeah. his company uh, to fill the gap of uh, lack of constitution. constitution. Right. And but you said you understand, but you don't agree. But I didn't understand what are your arguments, well, principal arguments against this approach. This approach includes uh, legislation through, uh, uh, Homer Piskedi. Well, I can explain that I agree largely with what the dean told us. Um, I believe in case and controversy. When you have a real case and controversy with people withstanding, you resolve it, and then you use the laws generally and you apply it across the board. I just think that uh, eliminating all standing, eliminating all case and controversy requirements, allowing NGOs to bring theoretical abstract cases goes too far. So my argument is not so different from the dean's argument. I suspect we'd land somewhere in the middle. I think maybe I would have a more centrist position than his on issues like standing. But um, I think I made my point that I fully understand and sympathize with what motivated the Supreme Court to move in the direction it did, but I respectfully disagree with how far it's gone. Why? Because it does undercut democracy when you give unelected judges the power to make decisions that should be made by elected officials in a democracy. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Last question? Yeah. Just yesterday, I believe, Canada filed a brief against um, Israel being criminalized in the ICC. That's right. Uh, ben Suda has been trying for the past seven, eight, 10, 12 months to avoid facing the issue. What do you feel could be the possible ramifications against Israel should she succumb to the political pressure and actually indict Israel or have <coughs> Israel face charges before the ICC? Uh, before the ICC? Well, That's one. Number two, if you could possibly address this, there is a tremendous growing chasm between Israeli Jews living in Israel and American Jews in the United States, what could be done to close that chasm and to perhaps uh, improve the former bipartisan mm -hmm. feelings towards Israel and the United States that are becoming increasingly eroded? Okay, two great eroded. questions. The second one would take me two hours to answer, but I'll answer it very briefly. Nothing is going to close the chasm. It's forever. Um, the United States cannot be counted on and the Jewish community in America can no longer be counted on to uh, create bipartisan support for Israel. Uh, Jews in America don't care about Israel for the most part. Um, if you ask the typical Jew what his 10 salient factors in voting, Israel comes out seventh or eighth. If it's attacked, maybe it'll get up to sixth or fifth. If Iran got nuclear weapons, maybe it would jump to second or third. But for the most part, American Jews don't care about Israel. So my message to Israel is, do not count on America. Do not count on continuing American support. Do not count on continuing bipartisan support. There's a 30% chance Sanders may be the next president of the United States. Not with my vote, but it may happen. Um, my hope is that the Democrats nominate a centrist like Joe Biden who supports Israel. But in the long term, Israel is on its own. And Israel must provide for its own defense, its own security, Hashem Ozli Amo Yutain, God will give the Jewish people strength. Hashem Yivarech Atamo B'Shalom. Only then will Israel have peace. Follow that mandate from the, the Psalms. Um, the, we are no longer, you know, everything's changed. Look at how the world has changed. I just wrote a book called Defending Israel. And in the end, the last chapter, I talk about the world as, I, as it existed when I started writing about Israel. Israel's strongest defenders were Turkey and Iran. 
Its strongest enemies were Egypt and um, Jordan. Look at that change. Its strongest defenders in America were liberal Democrats. Its strongest opponent were conservative Republicans. Everything has changed. Everything will continue to change. The only thing that remains constant is Israel's ability to defend itself. As Elie Wiesel warned, always remember, believe the threats of your enemies more than the promises of your friends. Israel, the Jewish people, were abandoned by America in the 30s and 40s and do not count on the United States of America. I will try my best. Others will try our best to keep this issue bipartisan. It may remain bipartisan in my lifetime, but not in your lifetime. Uh, I suspect the trends are in the opposite direction. And so it's very important for Israel to remain independent. Remember, too, that the United States engineered a resolution in the Security Council calling Israel's control over the Kotel a flagrant violation of international law. That showed ignorance on the part of those who wrote it, because it's not a violation of international law. But nonetheless, every country in the Security Council, England, Egypt, New Zealand, voted for that resolution at the behest of the United States. Don't let anybody fool you into thinking that Obama just went along. He engineered it. It was his personal revenge against Benjamin Netanyahu and against the state of Israel. So um, again, my message is maintain, maintain your, your uh, independence, your ability to defend yourself. If Iran were to develop a nuclear arsenal, there's no reason to believe that the United States, depending on who the president is, would support an Israeli decision to destroy it. Uh, remember that George Bush, who was a friend of Israel, did not support Ehud Elmert's decision to bomb the Syrian reactor in the United States under Reagan, condemned Israel for Danny, my friend, who was uh, part of um, an early mission on Iraq to destroy the Osiric nuclear reactor. Both were the right decisions for Israel, and it turned out both were the right decisions for the world. But don't count on external support. Israel is on its own and must always be uh, independently able to defend itself. Oh, oh, just, um, I just want to end with uh, one point, and that is, in Israel, they say a pessimist is someone who says, oh, things are so bad they can't get worse, and an optimist says, yes, they can. Uh, and uh, so I'm a combination. Uh, things can get worse, but things are very good for Israel today in the world. Um, Israel's strong, it's independent, it has a great economy, um, it has a great democracy, and... Um, and just my congratulations to you for, you know, 71 years of great achievements, and may you go from strength to strength. Thank you, thank you so much. I, I wish there were more time. Um, unfortunately, uh, I know that you have uh, many other engagements. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, and I have to say it's, it's, it's still a pleasure being your student. Thank you.